All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Today, I'm in this 2012 Land Rover Range Rover. This was the final year of what was known as the L322 model before it was replaced with the L405. By the time this car left the production line, the L322 had been in production for a decade, so it was time for a replacement. But many people still prefer this generation over its successor. I don't personally, but it's easy to see why some people do, because this car feels like more of a workhorse. It feels like you can rough it up a bit. It feels like more of a Range Rover. Harry Metcalf, Jeremy Clarkson, even Her Majesty the Queen have still stuck with their trusty L322s. And that tells you something, doesn't it? What's interesting is that the L405 is without doubt a better car. There are no two ways about it. It's lighter, more up to date, better on fuel, and way, way, way more luxurious. But I will concede, the L322 is actually a better Range Rover. You know, when you think about what the Range Rover was originally designed for, a rural vehicle that you could use all day on the farm, but still something nice enough that you could go out and use of an evening when you were going out to dinner. I think the L322 fits that bill perfectly. Land Rover gave the Range Rover a facelift in 2009 and made it look like this. So you got chunkier bumpers front and rear, new rear lights, which I love, new front lights, new side vents, and a whole new interior. It just dragged that old 2002 design right up to date. I think it looks class. It's a brilliant design, this. It's timeless. It's regal. It's majestic. In the right colour, you really don't know who's driving it. I think that's part of its charm. It could be anybody. Whenever I see one pimped out with black badges or chrome door handles, I do cringe a bit. But when I see a nice one without any privacy glass in a nice colour, like green or silver or gold, straight away I think they know what's what. They probably don't have a mortgage, they don't worry about the gas bill, they probably bank with coots. It's such an old money choice. It makes a statement without saying anything at all. Engine-wise, early facelift models came with a 3.6-litre turbo diesel V6, which produces about 270 horsepower. That was mated to a six-speed automatic gearbox. Or you could have gone with a 5-litre V8 petrol, which is an absolute beast. You will not believe how quick that thing is. But early examples suffer with bad timing chain guides, and that could be a three or four thousand pound job. So make sure that's been done. From 2011, they replaced the 3.6 TD V8 with this 4.4-litre TD V8, which produced an extra 35 horsepower. But crucially, they upgraded the gearbox as well. They did away with the old six-speed and instead replaced it with this much more modern eight-speed with a rotary gear selector. Now, if you're in the market for an old Range Rover, I would definitely recommend one of those 4.4-litre TDV8s with the eight-speed box. This produces around 310 horsepower, which is enough to make this two-ton tank genuinely feel sprightly. It does pin you into your seat. The power is relentless. I'm currently sat here at the speed limit, and all right, it's quite a windy day, so you might be able to pick up a bit of wind noise. But ordinarily, it is a very quiet place to be, mainly thanks to its double glazed windows and reams of insulation. This will do zero to 60 in 7.8 seconds, which is just ridiculous. It's like watching Miss Trunchbull beat Mo Farah in a race. You just can't wrap your head around it. Fuel-wise, you should get 23 miles per gallon around town and around 33 miles per gallon on a motorway run, which for a car of this size and weight, I think it's incredible. You won't be surprised to hear that this car isn't exactly Greenpeace friendly. Here in the UK, it sits in the second to highest tax bracket of £585 a year, and it isn't ULES friendly. So if you want to drive this down the Strand, you'll have to pay £15 per day. Being a Range Rover, it's extremely practical. You get the split folding tailgate, which is something of a Range Rover signature, but unlike the newer L405, you have to open and close this one by hand. And there are no soft closed doors like you'd get on an L405 either. See what I mean about it being less of a luxury car? You do get that strangely satisfying bank vault-like clunk when you close the doors though, so that's good. The boot space is very good, very deep, and because of the split folding tailgate, you'll find it extremely easy to load things in and out. You can even use the lower part of the tailgate as a seat, somewhere to sit while you're eating your sandwiches. The rear space is pretty good, although it's not as accommodating as you might expect, but back there your rear passengers get excellent visibility thanks to the very tall windows. In fact, I'm surprised they're not made from stained glass. And they get heated seats, and their own armrest so you certainly won't have any complaints from your rear passengers. Up front, there's plenty of space too. Plenty of headroom, plenty of legroom, plenty of elbow room, lots of space here. On parallel views, you get big tall windows, so it lets lots of light in, and there's storage everywhere. You get two glove compartments, you get more storage under here, two cup holders, in case you were wondering, decent sized door pockets. It really is a very well thought out car, this. The seats are some of the most comfortable seats I've ever sat in. I'd say definitely more comfortable than the L405. They're just softer, more sofa-like. From the minute you sit down in this, you'll just feel right at home. It just feels right. These facelift models get the new style digital dash with its moody scenery. It's a shame you can't customise them, because I'd quite like to jump in it and be able to see a, a nice blue sky. 
you certainly don't see one when you look up, most of the time anyway. Having said that, if you jumped into your Range Rover and saw a nice summer scene, us Brits just wouldn't buy it. We'd think it were too far-fetched. But the gauges are nice and big and bold and easy to read. You get two sun visors for that low winter sun, unlike you get in the Bentley Bentayga. And you get this new style steering wheel, which is just a pleasure to use. It feels lovely. It's heated too, something else you don't get in a quarter of a million pound Bentley Bentayga. And I've always loved these horn buttons. Just so delicate, so elegant. The infotainment screen was also upgraded. And this one features the mind-blowingly clever dual screen setup. So the driver can sit here watching the sat-nav while the passenger's sat there watching Sky News. I'm sure there's a perfectly logical explanation as to how that dual screen works, but I'm fairly certain it's just witchcraft. The screen is fairly quick to respond. Obviously, it is a 10-year-old system now, but it does a reasonable job. It has Bluetooth hands-free, so you can pair your phone to it to take calls, but it doesn't have Bluetooth streaming, so you can't stream your music via Bluetooth. It's still a bit too old-fashioned for that, but it does have a USB and auxiliary input. It comes with heated and ventilated seats, you get digital DAV radio, and you get a reversing camera. Although, they've mounted the reverse camera up very high, so when you use it, it will take a while to get used to it. In terms of ride quality, I would say this actually rides better than the L405. It just feels softer. When you start to push on through bends, it is a bit more wallowy. But it's definitely a tad more comfortable. The steering is just about perfect for a car like this. It's not overly assisted, but it's not too heavy either. It's just beautiful to operate. One thing I will say, it is a big old bus this, and you might find you struggle to park it in standard UK parking spots. I remember just before Christmas, I was doing a bit of Christmas shopping at the Trafford Centre in my full-size L405, and some idiot in a cash guy had parked that close to me when I got back to my car, I had to climb over through the passenger seat. I chuckled to myself because I thought perhaps they recognised my car and they were seeking some sort of revenge for all the things I've said about cash guys over the years. Anyway, you'll find yourself seeking out the most remote parking spaces, just so you can get in and out with ease. Reliability-wise, now this is where you'll all think I'm biased, but I promise you I'm not. I recently did a video with a Lexus LS430 and a Lexus SC430, and about 95% of the comments all said, oh, they're bulletproof cars, those, you'll do a million miles in that. My neighbour's dad's dog's got one and he's done two million miles in it, and the only thing that he's had to change is a light bulb. Rubbish. Absolute codswallop. They rust, they're no more reliable than anything else, and when things do break, parts are extremely expensive. So far I've spent thousands on those two Lexi, and I'm still not out of the woods yet. So they're just like any other complicated luxury car, and the Range Rover is no different. If you want something utterly reliable, then keep it simple, buy something like an old Yaris or Corolla. But you've got to wrap your head around the fact that these are complicated cars, and things will go wrong from time to time. But they do with every other brand as well, including Lexus but most people won't tell you that. From my experience, all cars are the same. They all break, and the more complicated the car is, the more issues you'll face. It's as simple as that. What I always preach is that you should buy a good one to begin with. That sounds obvious, but it is important. And then, straight away, do a full service so that everything's brought right up to date. Change all the fluids and all the filters. Give the gearbox a service. Run it on premium fuel, something like Shell V-Power or BP Ultimate. Treat it with respect, service it on time, and keep your fingers crossed. But most importantly, keep a couple of grand back. Put it into a sort of a, a rainy day fund. Because when things go wrong, and they will, at least you won't be caught out. If you don't, one fault will lead to another fault, which will lead to a dozen faults, and then you'll end up scrapping it, or trading it in with a dealer and not telling them the full story. Here are some of the things that can go wrong with the L322 Range Rover. But, little disclaimer, they can go wrong with any other car as well. So, you've got an EGR valve. In fact, on this model, you've got two. They need to be changed around 100,000 miles, and that will set you back around 1,000 pounds. This one's done 92, and they've been done already, by looking through the service history. They get clogged up over time, and they either stick open or stick closed. Either way, you're in limp mode, and you're going nowhere fast. The turbos can fail. That'll set you back around 3,000 pounds. The gearbox can fail, although to be fair, this later 8-speed box is way more reliable than the earlier 6-speeds, but still, service it, and it will last. The air suspension can fail. That's usually the compressor that pumps up the airbags on each corner. Now, you can buy these on eBay for about £300 refurbished, or from Land Rover for about £1,200. Or, if you're feeling brave enough and you've got the wherewithal, you could repair it yourself for about 50 pence. But it might take lots of cups of tea, lots of Google forums, and lots of swearing and slamming tools. The individual airbags on each corner can fail. So can the electronic handbrake, and that'll set you back around £800 to repair. Granted, that's a fairly long and fairly frightening list, but the same is true of every single car on the road. 
You've just got to be realistic. If you want one of these cars, then don't max out your budget. Only spend around 80 or 90% of your budget and keep some money back for repairs. Then when something breaks, and it probably will, you can just use your rainy day fund to sort it. So you don't have to worry and try and sell one of your kidneys or one of your kids. My buying advice, well, have you ever heard the phrase, buy cheap, buy twice? That is so true of the Range Rover. Buy a decent one to begin with. Buy one from a decent address or from a reputable dealer. Buy one with excellent service history. Buy one in a good colour combination rather than one that looks like it's been tampered with by exhibit. This particular car, a 2012 Westminster with 92,000 miles on the clock, I paid 13 and a half grand for it, which I kind of kicked myself for because had I seen it, there's no way I would have paid 13 and a half grand for it because I've spent two grand on it to bring it up to scratch. But you live and learn. Had I maxed out my budget at 13 and a half grand, then I wouldn't have had that two grand left over to repair it and bring it up to date. So then something would have broken, and then I'd have had this opinion that all Range Rovers are garbage. This is what I think most people do when buying a Range Rover. A quick tip when you're looking at Range Rovers is to check the radio presets. If number one is set to capital FM, then chances are they've just filled it up at the local supermarket at 20 pounds a time. If, on the other hand, it's set to Radio 4, you'll know that it's never been driven over the speed limit. It'll probably have a National Trust sticker on the front windscreen and a Royal Society for the Protection of Lifeboat stickers on the back. Another tip, this sounds stupid, but check the wiper blades. If they're Bosch and they're in good condition and they actually clear the windscreen, then you'll know that somebody's looked after it. If they just turn your windscreen into a smeary mess, then you know that it probably hasn't. I sometimes get a bit of flack for my generalizations and stereotyping. But trust me, without sounding arrogant, when you've bought and sold as many cars as I have and had to learn the hard way, learn the expensive way, there is a definite pattern that will emerge. These are the clues that I look for as soon as I get in a car. The number of keys, the service history, the condition, the wiper blades, the radio station presets, they all paint a picture for me. Over the years, I've just learned to trust my gut and I'm usually right. I've said this so many times now that it's probably getting boring, but there's just something about a full-size Range Rover. It immediately makes you feel special makes you feel successful. Your shoulders immediately go back and you just feel like the king of the road, if not the world. And there are very few cars with the ability to do that. To summarise then, the great car is the L322 Range Rover. I personally prefer the L405 because I prefer more of a luxury car. I don't need my car to be a, a workhorse. But if you intend to use your Range Rover, as Gordon Bashford and Spencer King intended, then you really can't beat the L322. It really is the best 4x4 by far. Well, thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. If you've got any comments or questions, let me know below and I'll do my best to get back to you. If you're interested in getting into the used car business, then check out my online course. I've created an online platform with nearly 100 videos which explain every single aspect of the used motor trade. Where to start, funding options, sourcing stock, trade plates, insurance, it's all there, so do check it out. I've also changed the payment side of things so it's far cheaper than it ever was, and it works like a subscription, so you can cancel at any point, no questions asked. There'll be regular Q&A sessions with me if you've got any questions or queries, so yeah, if you're interested, do check it out. Cheers guys, I'll see you next time.